All right, so let's try those problems. Okay, in the first one, our parent is a cyclohexane. We've got a bromine and a methyl group. So this would be one bromo, one methyl um, cyclohexane, right? So we would just give this carbon the number one. So we have one bromo, one methyl cyclohexane. And we don't have to um, give any stereochemistry because there's no chiral center in the molecule. The next one, there is a chiral center in it. And we could do that first. You can see that in the chiral center here, the highest priority group is going to be the chlorine. The second will be the butyl group. The third would be the propyl group. And the ethyl group would be last. And it's in the back. So we go one, two, three. So this is an R compound. We'll just delete all that here. We know this is some kind of R compound. And then if we look at the longest carbon chain, we're going to have to start numbering from the right hand side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's some kind of octane. We've got a four chloro, four ethyl. Right, so we've got R, let's see here, 4 chloro, 4 ethyl octane. And in the last one, did anybody get the stereochemical designation of the chiral center in the last one? Is it R or, or S and D? Anybody get that one? Yeah, I think you're right, Sarah. Yeah, so we have a hydrogen going in the back here. So the fluorine is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. So we're going like this. Yes, so it's an R compound. Good. So let's move on from there. So it's an R compound. And you can see that going either way, numbering from the left or the right, we have substituents at carbon number two. And so um, for this one, we're just going to start over here. One, two, three, because we have two substituents here, whereas we only have one here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have an R. We have R. Um, fluoro comes first, so five fluoro, and then two, two dimethyl, two, two dimethyl, and then our parent is hexane. So just remember the rule is, um, so this is answering your question, Savannah, when you only have one chiral center in the molecule, right? In this one, you only have one chiral center in and here, you don't have to provide a locant, right? Because the chemist, if they looked at the structure, they would know there's only one chiral center in it anyway. So they would know where to assign the R or the S. Okay, so only one chiral center, you don't need to designate any locant for it. When you have more than one, that's when you have to provide a locant for the chiral center because there's more than one. Does that make sense? OK, I hope so. Let's move on from there. And let's get into substitution reactions and concerted substitution reactions. So just let me find my notes here. So concerted substitution reactions. First of all, what does concerted mean? Does anybody know? In organic chemistry, concerted means at the same time, at the same time or together or simultaneous or anything like that. Um, so let's see here, substitution reactions that are concerted. A substitution reaction requires the loss of a leaving group in a nucleophilic attack. And there's two possible ways this could happen. It could either happen in a concerted fashion that means both things happen at the same time, meaning you have your nucleophilic attack and loss of leaving group occurring simultaneously. That's what we see down here at the bottom. This is a concerted mechanism. Again, I'm repeating myself here, but you see the nucleophilic attack is happening and the loss of leaving group are both happening in the same step. So again, we call that concerted when both things are happening at the same time. So that's number one. What about number two? What about the stepwise? Um, stepwise mechanism. What does that look like for a substitution reaction? Well, let's take a look. In a stepwise mechanism, the leaving group leaves first, and then the nucleophile is going to attack the resultant carbocation. So here again is the stepwise method or stepwise mechanism. First, we have our loss of leaving group. The leaving group just leaves. And if you're wondering, well, why in the first you know, reaction couldn't the leaving group just leave? Well, um, we're going to get into that in details. Um, and then you see the nucleophile is attacking the resultant carbocation. 
that we see here. And we end up with um, our, our substitution product. So um, we're gonna go over the stepwise mechanism later on in section 7.8. We're gonna cover that whole mechanism in, in dirty detail. But right now we're gonna stick on the concerted thing for a little bit. And we give a name to the concerted reaction, this concerted substitution, we call it an SN2 reaction, an SN2. So this is your real introduction to um, different namings uh, or different ways that we name mechanisms in organic chemistry. So SN2, what it stands for is substitution, is the S, N is for nucleophilic, and two is for um, second order. And that goes back to a rate law, right? Rate is equal to K times the concentration of substrate times the concentration of our nucleophile. And I'll get into that more in a second here. So look, we have our nucleophilic attack and our loss of leaving group occurring simultaneously. You see that we replaced the halogen for our nucleophile. And so we made a new carbon bond to our nucleophile and we lost the leaving group. So again, I went over where SN2 came from. So substitution, nucleophilic, bimolecular. How would you write the rate law for this reaction? Well, like I told you, this is a second order reaction. So second order reaction. And so the way that you would write this rate law is you would say rate is equal to K times the concentration of the nucleophile times the concentration of your substrate or your alkyl halide, which in this case is this you know, generic molecule that they have here. So that's how you would write out the rate law for this. And then it says, well, how would you design an experiment to confirm the rate law? What you would do is you would hold the concentration of the nucleophile constant and you would vary the concentration of the substrate and then monitor the effect on rate and make sure it's first order with respect to the substrate. And then you would reverse it. You'd maintain the concentration of the substrate and you'd vary the concentration of the nucleophile and make sure that that is first order. And that would enable you to do, be sure that it is, it is a second order reaction. So if we take a look at the stereochemistry, what if our substrate, what if our alkyl halide has a chiral center? And you can see that we have a beautiful chiral center in this molecule, there's no arguing that. And this is going to be our electrophile, right? This is our electrophile, right? We've gone over this many times. Why is this an electrophile? Because there's a dipole between the carbon and the bromine, which renders this carbon here partially positive, okay? And then we have a nucleophile here, and we've gone over that a few times. So nucleophile. It's a nucleus lover. Why? It's got a negative charge. So of course it's going to be seeking a nucleus. And you see that what happens here is that when the nucleophile attacks the electrophile, what we end up doing is we end up switching the stereochemistry from S to R. And the same thing would be true if we started with R, it would switch to S. And so we call this inversion of configuration. When you invert a stereocenter, we call this inversion. Yeah inversion of configuration, configuration. When you flip from R to S or S to R, and that always happens in an SN2 reaction, okay? In an SN2 reaction, if the SN2 is occurring at a chiral center, you always end up with inversion of configuration. So, why does that happen? Well, there's a couple of reasons what, how you could explain why we get this, what we call backside attack. So the nucleophile is attacking from the back face of the molecule. So one region, or one reason, excuse me, it says here, electron density repels the attacking nucleophile from the front side. So the nucleophile has to attack the backside to allow electrons to flow from the homo to the lumo. I'm never gonna ask you about any of this stuff right here. I'm not gonna ask you about the molecular orbitals whatsoever. It's more like this, is that you have all this electron density in the front because you have a very electronegative element. And so the nucleophile is going to do a backside attack. It's going to attack from the back face of the molecule like this. There's your nucleophilic attack and your loss of leaving group. So again, we have a name for this. We call it backside, backside attack in our SN2 reaction. And that backside attack is what results in the inversion of configuration. So it says here, draw the transition state that results for the following reaction. Explain why the SN2 proceeds with an inversion of configuration. So I'm not all that hung up on my students drawing transition states or anything like that. But the idea is this, is that you're starting with the methyl group, the hydrogen and the ethyl kind of pointing towards the left here. 
And then when the nucleophilic attack occurs, the way you would draw the transition state is like this. You would have your ethyl group going straight down, and then your methyl group's going to be kind of going up like this. You have your hydrogen kind of coming up like this. And then you have a partial bond to your bromine and a partial bond to your um, sulfhydryl like this. So that's kind of what your transition state is going to look like, right? And you're going to have a partial negative charge on here and a partial negative charge on there as the incoming nucleophile causes the leaving group to leave. But what happens is that we say that these three groups kind of flip like an umbrella in the wind. And if you're one, I mean, these three groups, the hydrogen, the methyl, and the ethyl, they're pointing to the left. And now over here, they're pointing to the right. So that's our inversion of configuration. Again, I'm not really that hung up on my students drawing transition states, but it is a good idea to try it at least once the way I did it. So with that in mind, it says here, draw the product for the following SN2 reaction. So remember, it's substitution nucleophilic bimolecular. So we've got a reaction between S2-chloropentane and um, uh, uh, NASH, okay? So the first thing we need to do is we need to draw S2-chloropentane. So let's draw S2-chloropentane. So what we'll do is we'll draw a pentane. We'll put a chlorine in here on a dash. And if it's not correct, we'll change it to a wedge. So let's see here. Is this an S molecule? We start from one to two to three. So that's going to be R. So yes, this is S because the hydrogen is coming out in front. So that's the correct molecule. And now we're going to react it with NASH. So let's put Na plus SH minus. Let's draw in all the lone pairs here. And so this is going to be our nucleophile, right? And this carbon is going to be our electrophilic center, right? This, this is the alpha carbon, right? The one attached directly to the halogen. So what's going to happen to my stereo center when I, um, after my nucleophilic attack? Could anybody answer that for me in the chat? What's going to happen to my stereo center? It's going to undergo inversion of configuration, exactly. So I'm going to draw up my pentane like this. And now my, my um, S is going to flip to an R like this. There we go. So somebody said, um, can you explain how you can know if it's an SN1 or 2 in respect to order? So um, we're, we're, we haven't covered SN1 yet, so I'm not going to get into that yet. But if it's SN2, it means it's a bimolecular, right? It means the reaction is second order. And that's something that you need to know from Gen Chem 2. So that would be largely a Gen Chem 2 topic. And it was also covered in Chapter 6 of this class, okay? So you would say that for this reaction, the rate law would be equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the substrate, okay? And multiplied by the concentration of the nucleophile in this case. So the rate depends on the concentration of both of these, the nucleophile and the substrate. Once we get to SN1, you'll see that the rate only depends on the concentration of the substrate. Does that make sense? And again, we'll get into the SN1 later. Okay, there you go. So that's how you would write out a rate law for this reaction, since it's a second order reaction. Okay, so let's talk about kinetics. How fast are these SN2 reactions going to, um, going to go? And it says, well, the less sterically hindered your electrophile is, the more readily it's going to react under SN2 conditions. And in fact, if you have a tertiary alkyl halide, it doesn't react at all via an SN2. Okay, if we think about a nucleophile, let me just draw some generic nucleophile here. Okay, let's imagine it's got a negative charge. Could it attack a methyl group? Oh, absolutely, right? Because there's only three hydrogens attached to that alpha carbon. So it's got plenty of room to come in and attack. Could it attack a primary alkyl? Oops, that's not a very good arrow. Could it attack a primary alkyl halide? Oh, absolutely too. Because the, the alpha carbon is only attached to a methyl group and it's got two hydrogens, of course. So it's not that sterically hindered. So it can attack there. So an SN2 will readily occur on a primary alkyl halide. On a secondary, uh, it's getting kind of crowded here because now the alpha carbon has two methyl groups and a hydrogen. And so, in fact, um, you know, the, the SN2 is not going to be the major mechanism here. And I'll discuss that more later. And then when we look at a tertiary, whoa, that's not even going to react at all. Why? Because the alpha carbon, this carbon has three methyl groups attached to it. So the nucleophile, it cannot attack there. 
It cannot attack that carbon. It's too sterically hindered. And so we don't see SN2 reactions on tertiary substrates. It just doesn't happen. Okay, it's not a thing. So don't worry about it one bit. Now, if you look at the reaction coordinate diagram, which I don't have in my slides, but the idea is that the activation energy would just get higher and higher as you go from methyl to primary to secondary and to tertiary where it gets just out of control. So if you look at this um, table here, this is a really interesting table, which you could spend quite a bit of time analyzing the data here. But first, let's just look at what's happening here is they're studying this generic reaction, okay, where you have some kind of alkyl bromide and it's reacting with iodide, which is a good nucleophile. Um, and it's a weak base also. It's, so it's a good nucleophile and you're just studying this SN2 process, right? So if I draw in the lone pairs on the iodide, all they're doing is studying this reaction, nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group, and then they're measuring the rate of the reaction based on what the R group is. So if we just focus on this part of the table right here, okay? If you have alpha substitution, you can see that you go from 145 down to one and then down to 0 0.008 for a methyl, right? And then here we have a primary alkyl halide and then a secondary, and you can see a tertiary, it doesn't even work. OK, so there's no SN2 on a tertiary. And so your conclusion might be, well, there you go. If I have a primary, it works. If I have a methyl, it works. If I have a secondary, it works. And this is where organic chemistry can get very frustrating. OK, so check this out. If you look at each one of these ones on the other side here, these are all primary alkyl halides. Okay, These are all primary. Every single alpha carbon, OK, every uh, this alpha, this alpha, this alpha, all four of these alpha carbons are attached to one carbon and two hydrogens, okay? Every one of those alpha carbons, I repeat, that I have written here in red, they're all attached to the same thing, one carbon and two hydrogens. Where do they differ? They differ on the substitution on the beta carbon. On the beta carbon, you just have three hydrogens. On the second one, it's attached to one alkyl group. On the third one, it's attached to two. And on the last one, it's attached to three. And look at this, even though these are all, all are, all are primary, okay? You notice that as the amount of beta substitution increases, that all of a sudden the rate just drops off, you know, dramatically to the point where it's practically useless to do this reaction, okay? Um, this compound, we call this compound here neopental bromide, which is neither here nor there, but the idea, and if you look at, did anybody read all of chapter seven? Did anybody read the entire chapter yet? Anyone? Yeah, cool. Okay, good. So you probably saw this, Hannah, that this is called neopental, neopental bromide. And there's a little sentence that I noticed that he says in the textbook. Um, it's been in all the editions, and it's a very good point. He says, you know, in organic chemistry, can you memorize your way through some things? Yes, I suppose you can. However, there's some concepts like this one here where it, it, understanding what's going on is way better than memorizing it, okay? Understanding the rationale as to why this compound is so unreactive. So again, if we look at the um, activation energies, you know, for an SN2 reaction, it says, um, what feature of the diagram is relevant to rationalize the rate of the reaction? Well, the answer to this would be the activation energy, right? The higher the activation energy is, the slower the rate, the lower the activation energy, the faster the rate. And so here we have a methyl alkyl halide. And so the activation energy, I guess, is relatively low. And it says, what do you notice about the thermodynamics? Well, I noticed that it's an exothermic reaction uh, or that the products are lower in potential energy than the reactant. So you end up with something more stable in the end. So with all that in mind, you know, when you look at the activation energies, it says, which one of these is gonna be the fastest reaction? The answer is always, the fastest rate is going to be whatever reaction has the lowest activation energy. And you can see that it's with a methyl substrate. A methyl substrate is going to react faster than a primary. And a primary is going to react faster than a secondary. And a tertiary, it doesn't even work. Okay? It will not work in an SN2. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, tertiary substrates are useless. They have uses, but they're not going to be useful in an SN2 reaction. And that's what we're discussing right now. So going back to that whole idea of neopental bromide. So this was the structure of neopental bromide. Okay, we had an alpha carbon that was attached to one carbon and two hydrogens, but then the beta carbon 
This one here was attached to one, two, three carbon. So this is neopental bromide. Now we've already discussed this, but we said neopental bromide is actually a primary alkyl halide, but it reacts very slowly in an SN2. And the reason why is because you have so much substitution at the beta position. So again, the reason this reacts so slowly is because of um, uh, substitution at beta carbon. Okay, so you can't just go off primary, secondary, tertiary, even though that's what we go over or what we use most of the time. You always want to examine the case very carefully. So what I'm really getting at here, and I think what he's trying to say in the textbook is that a good organic chemist has to be very observant. Right? You always have to be on the lookout for everything. You can't just try to memorize your way to an A. You know, you've got to try to seek the understanding of why molecules react the way they do. So um, it says here, what are the factors that contribute to the strength of a nucleophile? So I would say two things that we covered in section 6.7. So charge would be one, right? If you have a neutral, you know, if you have um, an alcohol versus an alkoxide, right? An alcohol is gonna be a weak nucleophile and an alkoxide is gonna be strong because it's got a negative charge, right? The other thing would be polarizability. So polarizability is gonna be the other factor, right? The more polarizable an atom is, the better nucleophile it's going to be, right? So if you were to compare an alcohol to a thiol, right, a thiol is gonna be more polarizable and therefore it's gonna be a better nucleophile. So it tells you here, just in plain English, that what you need for an SN2 is a strong nucleophile, okay? If you're doing an SN2, a weak nucleophile is not gonna cut the mustard. And so the first reaction that we see here, where you have hydroxide, which is a strong nucleophile, reacting with methyl iodide, is gonna react really quickly, okay? We get a great SN2, nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group. But if you look at the second reaction here, this thing is extremely slow. It's not gonna work, why? Even though you have a methyl halide, this is a great electrophile, but water is a very weak nucleophile. And it says here that you need a strong nucleophile or an SN2. And so you've got to be able to assess, is this a strong nucleophile? Is this a weak nucle nucleophile? There can be no question in your mind about that. And so you will want to either memorize or understand this table, one or the other, okay? You need to know this table. So know this table very well, very, very well. So what is something that make a good, makes a good nucleophile? You notice that everything is a strong nucleophile, has a negative charge on it. You notice that? Whether it's iodide, bromide, chloride, uh, sulfhydryl, this is called a thiolate, this is, a, this is an alkoxide, and this is a cyanide. You need to know everything here that has a negative charge on it counts as a strong nucleophile. So these are all really good in SN2 reactions. Whereas weak nucleophiles, which are basically water, water, and alcohols, Okay, those don't make strong nucleophiles, all right? They don't make strong nucleophiles. So you've got to have a negative charge and it, the more polarizable it is, the more nucleophilic it's going to be, all right? And it says the solvent also plays a role in nucleophilicity. I'm not gonna go into that in a whole lot of detail right now, but I think that that brings us to the end of SN2. So any questions about SN2 reactions before we move on? Because now we're going to get into another second order reaction, but it's going to be an elimination. So it's going to be an E2 reaction. So we've covered the SN2 reaction. Let me just go ahead here and show you something. This is going to be murder because I hate looking through all my slides like this. It's such a pain. Son of a gun, that didn't work. So, son of a gun, Mr. Dion, you are striking out. Okay, let me see if I can find that table. Okay, so I told started that you needed to know this table really, really well. And so, um, you know, when do you see um, SN2 reactions occurring? Well, you can see that all the cases where we have SN2 reactions, they always involve a strong nucleophile, right? They have to involve a strong nucleophile. Just because you have a strong nucleophile doesn't mean it's going to react via an SN2, but you need to have at least that, a strong nucleophile. And you can see that if your substrate is primary or, primary or secondary, you're only going to get SN2 if you have a strong nucleophile, which is also a weak base. 
But if you have a strong base, well, then you're going to have a competition between what we're going to look at now, which is the E2 reaction and SN2. All right. And if you go back here, you can see that we've covered these. We've covered all the strong nucleophiles. We didn't cover which ones are weak bases. And now we're going to cover, you know, what's a strong nucleophile, strong base and weak nucleophile, weak base. So we're going to, you know, kind of uncover this stuff more and more as we go through the slides here. So just bear with me as I try to find my place. I was somewhere around here. All righty. Okay, so again, any questions about SN2 before we move on? You've got to have a good nucleophile. Um, we covered what the strong nucleophiles are. Your electrophile has to be methyl, primary, or secondary. It doesn't work on a tertiary. Also, if you have a primary with three substituents in the beta position, it's going to be extremely slow and practically not work. Okay, well, let's get into the E2 reaction then. Uh, so where are we? Let's get ahead here. So section 7.5, again, SN2 is in the, is in the bag, kind of. We covered that, and now we're on to E2, right? And then after we're done E2, we'll get into SN1 and E1. So let's see this E2 reaction. Now, what do the two have in common? They both have the number two, right? So E2 is also a second order reaction. So that means the rate law or the rate of the reaction is gonna depend on the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of the base. So let's see here. It says when an alkyl halide is treated with a strong base, it can undergo beta elimination, which we also call one, two elimination. And you end up making an alkene. So you make a functional group, which is kind of cool. So hopefully you remember that if I have an alkyl halide, and again, X can be equal to chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Okay, the carbon that's directly attached to that is called the alpha carbon. An adjacent carbon is called a beta carbon. And if the beta carbon has a hydrogen on it, what can happen is that the base can abstract the proton. You form a double bond to make your alkene and you lose the leaving group simultaneously. And that is the E2 mechanism. So it is a concerted mechanism because all the steps are happening at the same time. So all steps at once, at once. The way my students are actually, somebody told me this when I was a student, is you can think SN together, E together, right? SN2 is SN together, all the steps happen together. And then E2 is E together, all the steps happen at once. So it's a concerted mechanism. And you can see somebody drew it here on the bottom and I just went over it with you. So you need to know this mechanism very, very well. You need to know the mechanism of SN2 by heart and you need to know the mechanism of E2 off by heart. So again, if it's a second order reaction, right? The rate law is gonna be rate is equal to K multiplied by the concentration of the alkyl halide and the concentration of the base. So it's the exact same rate law as, um, as a uh, SN2, it's just the substrate is gonna change. Right, instead of being methyl or primary, it's going to be probably going to be tertiary, okay, or, or, or maybe secondary. So we'll get into that in just a second. So let's see here. If you look at a reagent like sodium hydroxide and it goes to attack um, the alpha carbon as a nucleophile, but if the nucleophile, sorry, if the electrophile is too sterically hindered, then a nucleophilic attack can't occur. But if you look at the beta carbons, and there are three of them on this on this molecule, right? If you look at this beta carbon, okay? Now, obviously there are three hydrogens attached to it, one, two, three. They just drew in one for instructional purposes only. So I'm gonna delete those other two that I just put in. Okay, so what's gonna happen is you can abstract a proton because that proton is not hysterically hindered. Notice that the tip of the arrow here ends up right here where it's super encumbered by all these methyl groups but here the tip of the arrow ends up kind of like right on the edge, right? So it's gonna be easy, easier if you have a hindered substrate for it to react in an elimination reaction. So you're gonna abstract the proton, form the pi bond and lose the leaving group simultaneously, which would give you this compound. So this compound is isobutylene. And of course you'd end up with water and your leaving group. So if we look at this reaction here, so we have, um, uh, cyclopentyl chloride, or you could call it chlorocyclopentane. Both are completely acceptable. One's a common name, one's a systematic name. Uh, you can see that this is an elimination reaction, right? Because we're forming a pi bond. So it says, what happens to the rate of the, rea of what happens to the rate if the concentration, so let's start from the top. 
getting overly excited here. Okay, the following reaction exhibits a second order rate equation. So since it's an elimination, it must be an E2 reaction. So this is an E2 reaction. We can't argue with that. What happens to the rate um, if the concentration of the chlorocyclopentane is tripled and the concentration of sodium hydroxide remains the same? Well, first, let's write out a rate law. So if this is second order, it means that rate is going to be equal to the concentration of K, mul or sorry, K multiplied by the concentration of the chlorocyclopentane and the concentration of NaOH. So in A, if we were to double the concentration, uh, or sorry, triple the concentration of the electrophile and leave the sodium hydroxide the same, what's going to happen? Well, here's what we can do. Okay, we can imagine that rate is equal to K. Let's just imagine the rate is equal, to, that K is equal to one. So we'll just put one, and we'll put one molar for this and one molar for this. And there you go, and you end up with a rate of one. So in A, what's going to happen if you take rate and you multiply it by one and you triple the concentration of the chlorocyclopentane and you leave the concentration of the sodium hydroxide the same? What's it going to equal here? It's going to equal three. So that means the reaction is going to increase, the reaction rate is going to triple. Exactly. So we'll put here reaction rate triples, right? In B, it says, um, what happens to the rate if the concentration of chlorocyclopentane remains the same and the concentration of sodium hydroxide is doubled? So we'd say rate is equal to one times one times two. And so it's going to be equal to two. So we get reaction rate doubles. All right. And then in the last one in C, it says, what happens if the rate to the rate, if the concentration of chlorocyclopentane is doubled? and the sodium hydroxide is tripled. What's going to happen in that case? Exactly. Thanks, Katana. It's going to go up sixfold. So sixfold reaction. So reaction rate increases, increases sixfold. All right, there you go. So a little bit about rate laws for a second order reaction. So whether it's an SN2 or an E2, the rate law is always equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the substrate and your nucleophile or your base. All right, so now we've covered E2. So at this point, we've covered we've covered SN2, it's done, and we've covered E2, that's done. So let's cover one more section before we take another break. And I want to take a look at section 7.6, which deals with alkene stability. Because in E2 reactions, we make alkenes, right? So we'll put here, make alkenes in E2 reactions. So if we're making alkenes, we have to talk about them a little bit. All right. so. You should remember from chapter five that we can have cis-trans isomerism in an alkene. And here we have trans-2-butene, and then we have cis-2-butene. Well, you can probably guess just by looking at the two space-filling models here that cis-2-butene is going to be less stable. So it says here, cis isomers are generally less stable than trans. It's just because of sterics, right? These two methyl groups are blocking each other. In trans-2-butene, we don't see that. So you can also quantify this difference if you do a combustion experiment on trans-2-butene and cis-2-butene. You can see that uh, cis-2-butene releases more energy, right? So it releases more heat. So more heat released, um, we'll put here, therefore less stable, less stable. It was higher in energy to begin with. So it re released a little bit more energy. And again, it's just kind of looking at the same thing here, and this is just a diagram of the two, and you can see that there's an increase in stability of the alkene that is trans versus cis by about four kilojoules per mole. So you might say, oh, it's not that much. Well, it's something. And so I want you to keep that in mind, okay? That's really, I just want you to know if you have a trans alkene, generally speaking, it's going to be more stable than a cis, and that's going to be pertinent. It will be pertinent when we start drawing all kinds of different E2 products. 
So here's something that you would you probably never would have guessed, okay, unless I told you this. But when it comes to an alkene, the more R groups that you have, so let's see, if you have an alkene, an alkene like this, you have a carbon-carbon double bond, the more R groups you have attached to the sp2 hybridized carbons, then the more stable the alkene becomes. Okay, that's really all there is to it. So you can see that as you go from one substituent to two to three to four, um, it gets more and more stable. So the take home message here is more alkyl groups is more stable. And it's kind of like, um, it's, it's difficult to explain this, but it's almost like the hyperconjugation in a way. The more R groups you have, the more electron density is donated to the carbons of the double bond and it stabilizes them. That's, that's it would almost be beyond the scope of our course. In fact, I would say it is. And so I'm never going to ask you to write an essay about that or anything like that. It's just more of an FYI, just to make sure that you're aware of that. Okay. The next part, it says, arrange each set of isomeric alkenes in order of stability. So if I call this one, I'll call this one A, I'll call this one B, and I'll call this one C. Could anybody tell me which one of these is going to be the most stable? So we'll put most stable, the least stable. Which one would be the most stable here? Yeah, it's going to be A, isn't it? Right, A is going to be the most stable. Which one is going to be the least stable of all these? Yeah, it's going to be B, be the least stable, and C is somewhere in the middle. The reason why is that A is tetra substituted. Okay, C is tri substituted, and then B is di substituted. So that's why it would be the least stable of all. There you go. If you've ever wondered about incorporating a double bond into a cyclo, a cyclo, or making a cycloalkene, if you're like, can it be done? Yeah, it can be. The only thing about this is if you have less than seven carbons in a ring, it's always a cis double bond. There's no way you can incorporate a trans double bond into anything this small. It would be impossible. Don't even make me try to draw it. It'll make my head hurt. So if you were to do something like this and then try to, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, there's no such ring like that. It doesn't exist, okay? So all the bonds in here, they're all cis. Right? This is cis. This is cis, this is cis, okay, this is cis. So you don't have to call them cis cyclopropene, cis cyclobutene, it's redundant, okay? And it says here that when applied to a bridge bicycloalkene, this rule is called um, uh, Brett's rule when we're talking about whether we can have a cis or trans uh, uh, alkene in a ring. I'm not going to quiz you on Brett's rule at all, okay? I'll put here Brett's rule will not ask. Okay, I'm not going to ask you anything about Brett's rule. So I'm just going to skip Brett's rule for now uh, and just get into section 7.7 .7, where we get into E2 and we start looking at, well, what happens when you have a substrate like this compound here? So you'd call this 2-bromo-2-methyl-2-methylbutane. Two two so this is 2-bromo-2-methyl-butane. Two okay, this is my alpha carbon. This beta carbon is a methyl, this beta carbon is a methyl, but this beta carbon is a methylene, right? So we have two different types of beta carbons in here. Give me a thumbs up if you see that. Two different types of beta carbons. The methyls that are in blue, and then we have, yeah, and then we have the methylene, the CH2 that's in black. Okay, so I'm going to erase that right now. So that means we've got two types of beta protons, right? We've got this black one here, and then we have this blue one here. Okay, so there's two types of beta protons and this that didn't work there so we've got two types of beta protons now if i look at this this is a secondary alkyl halide okay so it's not going to be that reactive towards an sn2 but it's very reactive for an e2 so we have the eth oxide which is a strong base okay it's a very good base so the question becomes is it going to pull off the blue proton eh. The blue proton like this, make the double bond here and lose the leaving group like this. That would give you this compound. Okay. Or let me just erase this stuff here. Would it pull off the black proton? Well, let me do that. So if it pulled off this proton, then it would form a double bond here and lose the bromine, lose the bromide 
like this, which, which mechanism is going to be prevalent? Well, you can see that it's the Zaitsev product, what we call the Zaitsev product, or the more substituted alkene is the major product here. Okay, so Zaitsev is going to be more substituted, right? This double bond is attached to one, two, three R groups, whereas in the other product, the Hoffman product, it's only attached to one, two R groups. So this is the less substituted, less substituted. So could anybody tell me which one of these is more stable? Is it the Zaitsev or the Hoffman? I mean, it says it right in here. It's the Zaitsev product that's going to be the more stable. Exactly, because it's more substituted. So more substituted, therefore more stable. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, if I ever have a choice between two beta protons, I'm always going to make the most substituted, most substituted alkene as the major product. Hold the phone because it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we get the less substituted product as the major product, and that's going to depend on our choice of base. So check this out. This is really crazy here, is that we can get different what we call regio selectivity. That means we can be selective for that blue proton to give us the Hoffman product, or we can be selective for the black proton to give us the Zaitsev, uh, yes, the Zaitsev product. How do we determine which one we're going to get? Okay, how do we determine, you know, which one we're going to get? It was by our choice of base. So you can literally go to the cupboard, okay, choose a different base, one over another, and you can um, increase the amount of Zaitsev or increase the amount of Hoffman. So you're wondering, well, how do you do that? Well, let's take a look here. It says experimental data indicates that a bulky, sterically hindered base will favor the formation of the Hoffman product, but an unhindered base like ethoxide is going to favor the Zaitsev product. So if we think about this very carefully, okay, um, when I'm forming the Zaitsev product, okay, this hydrogen here, okay, you can see that this carbon is attached to one, two carbons. So it's going to be more sterically hindered than the other beta carbon. So let me just redraw the molecule over here. If I redraw it, try to draw it, Dr. Cl no, that's not very good. Let me fix it up here. So here's the methyl, here's the bromine, here's the other methyl. So there you go. Okay, so now if we think about the blue proton, this carbon is attached to one, two carbons. Okay, but it also has the bromine in the way instead of, um, uh, or sorry, it's only a, sorry, my mistake. Um, I've labeled the wrong carbon. It's my mistake. Okay, the alpha carbon is only attached to one carbon, so it's less sterically hindered. Okay, so the idea is this: is that if you have a tiny little base like ethoxide, it's really small, so it's going to be able to get to this more hindered proton to make the more substitu substituted alkene. So it's going to go in here, right? Again, this alpha carbon is attached to two carbons. So it's going to do this, and you're going to lose your bromide like that, okay? Um, and that's going to give you the Zaitsev product. However, if you have a big old bulky base like tert-butoxide, so this is called tert-butoxide, tert okay? It's so big and bulky that it cannot do that, okay? Let me just erase these arrows here. It is not going to do this. It is... It can do it to some extent, but it's going to be harder for it to get in there because it's so big and bulky, and this guy is flanked by both of these carbons. So it's going to be easier for the tert-butoxide to come over and pluck this guy, which is less sterically hindered. And so we do get a mixture, but it's going to favor the less substituted alkene. Give me a thumbs up if you understand what I'm trying to explain to you right now. The bulky base is going to pick off the blue proton because it's less sterically hindered, even though it gives you a less stable product, you know, whereas the unhindered base like ethoxide, another unhindered base would be methoxide. So MeO minus, right? That would be another unhindered base. That's going to be able to pick up that more hindered proton to give you the more stable, um, the more stable alkene. And then you have this thing here, which is just ridiculous. It's so big and bulky. I think this is the only time we see it in the course. It's um, so bulky that it gives you almost exclusively the Hoffman and very little Zaitsev. There you go. So this is something that's going to come up all the time. If we use methoxide or ethoxide, those are what we call unhindered 
bases. So those are unhindered bases. And T-butoxide, this is what we call a hindered base. Hindered base. So again, the unhindered base is going to favor the Zaitsev product, and the hindered base is going to favor the formation of the Hoffman product. I can't tell you how important this is. This is going to come up probably every day in this class for the rest of the semester, and it comes up pretty much every day in organic too. These th this concept hindered base gives you the um, the Hoffman product, and an unhindered base gives you the Zaitsev. All right, super duper important. Okay, so we've gone over this question. We've answered it. Why the sterically hindered base favors the Hoffman product? Because it's going to grab um, the least uh, hindered proton to make that uh, less substituted alkene. So what are some other th bases we could use besides T-butoxide? Okay, usually we use potassium T-butoxide. So we just abbreviate it this way, T-B-U-O-K. Other ones that we use are diisopropylamine. We call that diisopropyl um, amine. Actually, I don't even have an acronym for this one, so we'll just leave it like that. And then the last one is triethylamine. The acronym that we use sometimes for that is TEA, but even that, I rarely use it. So these would be examples of hindered bases, okay? Um, also, we call these non-nucleophilic bases because they don't work as nucleophiles because they can't get to an electrophilic carbon. If they can't reach it, they're too big and bulky. So there you go. All right. So with that in mind, that brings us to this problem here. You can see that we have some unhindered bases here. So let me go back here and I'll put here hydroxide. I'll add that too. So hydroxide would also be another unhindered base that you could put in there. Um, so we have unhindered bases like hydroxide, ethoxide, and then we have the big old hindered base here, T-butoxide. So what I want you to try to do is answer this question. And I want you to try to draw both the major and the minor products for each of the reactions. And you can try to label them as being Zaitsev or Hoffman. Try your best at doing that. And then we'll come back. And then just to put this bug in your ear, um, after that, we get into not just stereoselectivity, but we're going to talk about what's called stereospecificity. This is a very, uh, or I would say quite a challenging part of this course, okay? Do you guys remember the Newman projection? Thumbs up if you remember the Newman projection, right? We practiced looking down a carbon-carbon bond with our eyeball like this, and we drew the carbon in the back, the carbon in front, yeah? So you're going to need that in order to determine the stereospecificity of an E2 reaction. This question always shows up on the final exam, so stereospecificity of an E2, and I'll definitely ask you about it at least once, maybe twice, on the quiz, and it's always a, a toughie for my students. So I'm going to do my best to explain it to you in the simplest possible way. And uh, yeah, so why don't we take a break, and then we're going to come back and try these problems. Then we'll talk a little bit more about stereoselectivity and stereospecificity.